Thank you for staying with us. Uh, President Muhammad Buhari has once again reassured Nigerians that the 2023 elections will be free, fair and credible. He disclosed this during the celebration of his 80th birthday in the United States, where he attended the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit. He says INEC has no excuse not to conduct credible, free and fair elections despite the attacks on its facilities as the funds it requested had been made available to it. But the commission disagrees with the president on this. INEC says its funds are overstretched by the attacks as it would have to rebuild and replace the destroyed facilities and buy back materials that were also destroyed. According to INEC, since the conduct of the 2019 general election, it has experienced a total of 50 attacks on its facilities in different parts of the country. How much of a threat does uh, this pose to INEC as we count down to the 2023 general election? Joining us now in the studio is uh, the Executive Director, Journalists for Democratic Rights, Adewale Adeoye. Good morning. Thank uh, you for morning. joining us on TVC yeah, Breakfast. You. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. On the one hand, the President is saying you have no excuse. INEC is saying that we have been, our funds have been overstretched because they didn't perhaps budget for the attacks that it is witnessing. What do you make of this, uh, you know, this conversation between the President and INEC? Well, I think the two positions are contrary. They are not actually contradictory. Uh, the president is saying he has made provision, which is true. But I think he's also saying that, look, there are some challenges that we're having at the moment, which probably we did not anticipate. Mm. And uh, don't forget that Nigeria is a transition democracy. Mm. In normal democracies, you have probably about $1 per voter. You know, cost of voter reg uh, register, you know, in the election, maybe about $1. In a traditional democracy, all over the world, it's rated between $4 to $4 to $8. Why impose conflict countries? It's about $9. Now, you are talking about 100 million voters in Nigeria. So if an average voter, we are, supposed, we are expected to spend between uh, $4 to $6, then that is a lot of money. And of course, the destruction of uh, INEC offices across the country. I don't think anybody will have anticipated this. Mm -hmm. And in any case, a provision of security for the INEC office is not the job of INEC. It is the job of security officials. So um, I think we need to look at both uh, arguments mm -hmm. and at the end of the day be able to come up with a position to ensure that the election holds and that the expectations of INEC are met. Now they are demanding for 305 billion naira. That's a lot, lot of money. Mm -hmm. Apart from the 40 billion that is allocated to INEC every year. This is the highest we have ever seen mm -hmm. for several years. But then you have to look at you know, the dynamics of the economy. In 2011, the budget was 139 billion. You know? In 2019, it was 189 billion. But as, at that time, the exchange rate was about 300 you know, naira to one dollar. So things have changed over the years. And uh, what is important is that we should also not shy away from the need to audit, you know, to call INEC, you know, to be accountable. Yes. You know, to, you know, in terms of uh, auditing the accounts and all that. But I think there is no amount we spend on democracy that uh, we can say is too much. We need to deepen democracy. We need to broaden the democratic space. And all over the world, elections cost a lot of money. Mm. Mm. Now, well, the election in Nigeria, of course, it will not be different from others in other countries when it comes to uh, huge investments into ensuring that they, they have the, the backbone, the mechanism, the structure, and all of that that needs to go into yeah. it. Uh, however, the, the issue there is that INEC is uh, one organization that Nigerians have come to trust with time for every yeah. single election they yeah. conduct mm. from uh, the staggered elections, mm. you know, and all of that. They've been, they've been able to improve on themselves marginally for, of course, with little, little lapses here and there. But then Nigerians have come to trust INEC. And with the way INEC has been engaging Nigerians over every single opportunity they have, they tell Nigerians what is on ground and, and so on. Is there any reason why the government shouldn't give them everything that they need, whatever they request for? Uh, we first of all need to understand that the cost of 
uh, electoral commissions mm. depends on a lot of factors. Uh, the size of the democracy, mm -hmm. mm. you know, Nigeria is the biggest democracy in Africa. In fact, the whole black world with about 200 million people. We are talking about 100 million uh, voters. Then the structure, you know, we are talking about 179, 176,000 polling booths mm. across the country. Uh, recently, we have added 56,000, which now makes about 179,000 uh, polling booths. Then we are also looking at the frequency of elections. You know, we have ele our elections in every four years. But then there are off-season elections, mm. you know, there are by-elections. So when you look at all these things, you know, it costs a lot of money. Mm. And, um, you know, to sustain this kind of democratic structure, it, we need to invest in it. So I think I like requesting for $305 billion. Uh, what, what, what should we say is how are we going to read? Because the Nigerian budget is about $20.5 trillion. So, and, you know, most of these budgets that Gila wants to run, is going, we don't have the money. We have to finance debts and all that. So we have to balance it within the context of our economy. But we should also realize that this election is coming in 2023. We are not going to have another election until the next four years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is not what we have all the time. So whatever INEC needs, I think we should be able to provide all their needs so that there will be no excuse for us to... <laughs> You know, because without democracy, we can't be talking about prosperity and development. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the, in fact, it's the major pillar of, you know, uh, any, when we're talking about prosperity and peace. So we need to invest in democracy. We need to give them all the assistance that they need. And I think, the, like you have said, INEC has been able to, to establish the fact that to a very large extent, it is credible. And I think it's, it is due to the fact that over years, we have been able to produce INEC chairmen that are, you know, men of integrity. You know, even when Sakari was there, I mean, we've never had a situation where there are questions about the integrity of the annex chairman. So we need to sustain this tempo by ensuring that at least we give them all the strategic support that they need. Uh, but there's the question of does allocating more resources actually guarantee free, fair, transparent elections? Yeah. No. Mm. Uh, it does not guarantee free, fair elections. Because... Uh, if we, we see what we have been having since 1999, I don't think INEC has ever been shortchanged. You know, each time they come up with budget, the government tries as much as possible to meet their demands. But that has not guaranteed free and fair election. Not necessarily that INEC has to be very responsible at all times. You know, the political class, you know, also has its own blame. And also the voters, too. And when we are talking about free and fair election, it's not, it, you know, it, it goes beyond INEC. We're also talking about the primaries, mm. you know, the process that people emerge, you know, in the pr uh, primaries that produce the candidates. A situation where political parties are not really run by, uh, uh, they are not owned by members. In the past, you know, p uh, political parties raise their funds from donations mm. from members. But that is not the case these days. We're having a situation where people, political parties raise, for, uh, raise, for me, uh, raise funds from, uh, you know, uh, people of questionable characters. So and when it comes to primaries, people buy their way. So there is a limit to which INEC can control the internal democracy within the political parties. Mm -hmm. So when we are talking about free and fair election, the political parties also have very important roles to play. And also the voters that are she's at its easing system, people come and give voters money. You know, voters must be able to also know that they don't need to sell their for sure. They don't need to sell their conscience. So I think it's a collective responsibility. We should not be talking. And even the media, we also have our own role to play in terms of educating the voters, in terms of engaging the contradiction within the electoral system so that we can ensure that uh, during elections, you know, people vote out of their own free will and not induced, you know, by uh, perks and uh, privileges. All right, INEC, INEC has some level of powers that uh, Nigerians have not seen it wield yeah. in some extent, especially when we talk about the issue of persecution of election offenders. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in the Electoral Act, all of those things are there. Everything of most of the things are spelt out. Yet, we haven't seen INEC come out to say or to prosecute anyone in, in that regard. In the last elections, uh, the primary election that took place in the, some of the presidential primary elections, and then also in some of the other off -season, recent off-season elections, yeah. we saw the partnership between INEC and EFCC, mm -hmm. you know, as a way of trying to curb vote buying and all of that. 
But when we see people who are involved in either thuggery or in other kind of issues that could compromise uh, the election process or the polling, we've not really seen prosecution much. What do you say in that regard when it comes to functioning? Well, I, I think that's one of the fault lines, mm. you know, of our democracy, that uh, people, after committing electoral crimes, you know, they get, out, they get away with it. We have seen instances where there are court judgments by the highest court in the land, you know, that a particular candidate, you know, came to power through rigging and fraud. This same candidate will come back and contest again. We have seen that happen, you know. Look at the KTC, for instance. During the elections in 2007, you know, a particular candidate was said to have rigged the election, but he came back again to contest the election over and over again. So these things are not right. And I think we should devise a means where when you are caught wanting in the electoral process, the INEC should be able to come out with laws that will ensure that such people at least will be suspended from the political sp space mm -hmm. for a period of time. And also, when we are talking about rigging elections, um, the INEC may get all the materials, but the police still needs to you know, investigate the process and also ensure that people are taken to court to be prosecuted. So the police that uh, you know, provide security during elections have also been you know, found wanting because we expect the police to also arrest those that are found to be giving bribe to, you know, to voters so that when they are arrested, they'll be taken to court and prosecuted. And what we are talking about arresting people, it's not just about the voters, the ordinary voters, the big time uh, you know, uh, politicians who, when we are going on campaign, they, bag, you know, they buy with the bags of rice, you know, go to palaces, give money to traditional rulers. You know, so it's not just about the small fries. We are also talking about big time fraudulent politicians. We also need to track, you know, uh, campaign funding. Mm. You know, where do they get their funds? That's a big mm. millions of naira <laughs> that every every time you dash out to to voters. So where do they get these funds? You know. So I think we need to do a lot of work, and it has to be a kind of uh, collaboration between the uh, INEC, EFCC, the police, and even the civil defense corps. Mm. So and even society organizations. We need to help INEC to be able to meet up. To global standards in terms of prosecuting, you know, uh, offenders. So we're looking at uh, President Muhammadu Buhari's uh, reassurance of uh, ensuring that Nigeria has a free, fair, and credible elections come 2023, and that uh, INEC has no excuse. And then we also have been speaking about the concerns of INEC, where it talked about the fact that um, the current, the consistent attacks on its facilities, and then <clears throat> also spoke about uh, the rising inflation and all of it affecting its uh, demands so with regards to achieving what the president wants, the concerns, uh, before we went on the break. And then uh, we have in the studio Executive Director, Journalists for Democratic Rights, Adiwale Adewi, speaking to us on that. I am concerned about this rising cost of yeah. e elections. Is it something that we can sustain? Our inflation keeps rising. Yeah. The highest we have seen in over 20 years, as it's been recorded by the NBS, and we are still having the rising cost with regards to our elections. Can we sustain it? Shouldn't we be looking at cutting costs as it stands? Well, what is clear now is that an unstable economic environment will affect political stability because we can't continue to pretend that there's no way the economy downturn we now will not affect our ability to have democratic elections. Because when we are spending almost about more than 100%, I mean, about 100% service in debts, you know, inflation is going up, people cannot feed, you know, you are going to be confronted with violent outbursts in different forms, you know, because uh, people gradually are also losing confidence in terms of what do we gain each four years that we go to the post to vote, what are the dividends that we're having? You know, at the end of each election season, you find a situation where people are losing their jobs, the NRA is falling, people can no longer, they, you know, the, 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 the capacity to purchase their essentials of life has diminished, mm. continue to diminish. So there is no way we can continue to talk about democracy if people are not enjoying the dividends. Eventually, we are going to, you know, it's going to be self defeated We are going to suffer the repercussion. Mm. So if we really want to democracy to grow, then 
people being elected to power, they must prove, they must justify the cost of democracy. They must justify the investment individuals make going out every, every time to queue up, to vote. They must justify the trust that people have in them. And when you look at all over the country, when we are talking about violence and all that, it's a reflection of the fact that, you know, the, the lack of confidence in the system is growing. So in order to be able to re-energize the people, to give them more confidence, politicians must deliver on their promises. You know, if there are no good roads, there are no food for people who cannot go to farms, you know, because of insecurity, people are losing their jobs, their purchasing power is going down, then why, are we, why are we asking them to come and vote all the time? Mm. So we need to give confidence to the voters. And the only way we can do it is to ensure that we deliver, you know, in terms of economic deliverables, good roads, energy, uh, food, uh, security. If those things are not there, people will not find it justifiable to go and vote each time you ask them to come out. And of course, if you look at what has been happening, happening in the past few years, the, num the vote voters' turnout is going down. Yes. People are asking questions every time I go and vote. Then what do I benefit? What is my gain? Apart from the one-off, 2,000, 5,000, after that, you know, nothing comes to the table. Mm. So if we really want democracy to grow, politicians must deliver on their promises so as to give confidence to the voters. Mm. All right, now let's talk about the issue of uh, inclusion of people, a chunk of number of people who don't really vote. We have seen in this country in the last, uh, in fact, since inception, the media, people who are very busy, in fact, for us media here, every time there's election, we are all busy on either on the field yeah. or in the studio, mm -hmm. being involved on, for one thing or the other because we need to bring to the people what's yeah. going on mm -hmm. on the go. Security agents who are there ensuring that the election has to take place and has to happen the way it's supposed to be, you know, and all of that, always don't get to vote. Then, not to talk of uh, the diaspora. Yeah. Now, these are a lot of Nigerians who, if they become part of the system, can also add to the numbers that we're talking about. Now, what do you make of this? If you travel to South Africa or Kenya or, or even, even India and, and some other countries, their voting process cuts across several days mm. or sometimes even mm. a week mm. to create room for everybody who is going to be involved in essential duty on election day to vote first mm. before, like the aged, those who are sick, you know, and uh, uh, the, the media, security agents, and all of that. What would it take to have a situation like that in Nigeria? Because we are a country, it's becoming obvious that we can't all vote in one day. Yeah. I think that is one major issue that INEC has not been able to resolve. Because the kernel, the ground norm of democracy is the expression of the majority of the people mm. to vote out of their own free, prior, and informed consent. But in, in Nigeria, you have a situation where a lot of people are excluded, not out of their own volition. Mm. Mm -hmm. For instance, physically challenged people, the population in Nigeria is more than 4 million people who are physically challenged. Most of them don't have access to opportunity to express their electoral rights. We are even talking about medical personnel who are expected to work on voting dates mm -hmm. in health institutions. <clears throat> we are talking of journalists. We are talking of security operatives who by virtue of their work cannot leave their duty. And that's why I think I should have devised a means where people can vote online. And that's why you see that each election you have less than in fact, less than 30% of the registered voters voting in each election. And I think it's a very major problem because it, it boils down to the fact that democracy that we are talking about is not actually the, you know, the expression of the will of majority of Nigerians. People are also in diaspora. You know, we need to give them, because they are Nigerians. Yes. And what usually happens, look at Ivory Coast, for instance. We have about 3.5 million Nigerians living in Cote d'Ivoire. What they do all the time is that they come back home you can imagine the risk, the time, the money spent. But how many of them can come back home to their country to vote? So there must be opportunities for Nigerians living outside this country, either in UK, either in US, or in the West African sub-region, to be able to express their right to vote. Even if there are some people that travel through elections, they need to travel because there are some duties they need to attend to outside the country. Those people are denied because we don't have process where people can vote online. I think that's a major setback 
for our democracy. And I think on the this is ad address, we will not be able to say that we're actually having democracy, you know, in its true form and character. Now, there are those who even say that it is cheaper to do vote online. Yeah. When you look at the online voting and all of it, it's cheaper. And that uh, perhaps uh, the politicians are not mm -hmm. looking into that direction because of how it might uh, affect them, so to yeah. speak. But this matter of um, attacks on, you know, INEC facilities, over 50 attacks, you know, in recent days, and it has become worrisome. I wonder what you make of this development as an it's attacking, you know, INEC facilities, what it means for our democracy. Well, I think it's a very dangerous trend because, first of all, it's going to affect the, num the turnout on election day. People will are afraid of violence. If, if people know that they may be attacked, why should they need to go and risk their lives on behalf of who? Then I also think that it's a, it's a call, you know, it's a clarion call on our security operatives that we expect them to raise the bar, especially when elections are close by. We've had security problems, terrorism, Northwest, violence and all that, but now we have a situation in the southeast where INEC offices have been attacked. Even in the southwest, mm -hmm. it has happened. At least two oh, INEC well, offices have been yeah. attacked. Yeah. So what is embarrassing is that these things have been happening for the past three months, but we have not heard of arrest and prosecution. And I know that one would have expected that at least there should be some kind of you know, protection. Do, does, it, does it mean that they don't have CCTV camera? Does it mean that those INEC offices are not protected? We have 36 states, and that's uh, Prosabuja, 30, 37 headquarters state, um, you know, INEC offices. 37 offices shouldn't be, it should not be so difficult for the security operators to protect them. At least by now, I expect those offices to have CCTV. I expect them to have at least two or three security personnel. And of course, there are vulnerable areas that you know that this place these places are areas that you need to be more protected mm. than other areas. For instance, Lagos might say, okay, we, you know, less protection compared with other states. So you should know those, uh, you know, hotspots. And the normal thing we expect the security officers to do is to deploy more security office, uh, officers into these areas. That is not being done. People are not being arrested. And it means that they'll be emboldened to carry out, you know, more attacks on INS facilities. And if they're attacking INS facilities and nothing happens, they might go after their personnel if there's no protection for them. Unfortunately, INEX are not armed, and we don't think we should get to a situation where we should ask them to be carrying arms. That's not going to be good. So I think we need to do more in terms of providing uh, security for INEC offices and also providing security for INEC officials as, you know, ahead of the 2003 elections. All right. Now let's look at uh, the coming election. What, what factors do you think will shape the way that people are going to vote in the coming elections, especially when you look at the campaign temperaments or the yeah. temperature, what the candidates are saying, what their followers are saying, what they are ready to do, what they are not ready to do, you know, and all of that mix. What, what do you think it will shape the way that people vote in the next election? Well, I think a lot of factors will shape the outcome of the coming election. Uh, people may not like to hear this, but it's a reality. If you look at history, if you look at precedents, history is our witness. Mm. The structure of the political party, in fact, it will determine at least about 70% of victory. Mm. If you are a political party, what are the structures that you have? Did you have representatives in the 776 local government areas? Did you have contacts in all the 176,000 polling booths across the country? Mm. Did you have officials? that we campaign using the party platforms. For instance, did you have state governors? Did you have House of Assembly members? Did you have senators? Because these are individuals. Because their interests also come in line mm -hmm. with the election. They want to ensure that they win elections. They also want to ensure that they win their constituencies. Mm -hmm. And so, their party also wins. Oh, their party wins. So if you don't have members in the House of Assembly, you don't have members in the House of Rep, you don't have members in the National Assembly, it's going to be it's a big minus for, for you. Because when we are talking about elections, it's about people. Mm -hmm. It's about structure. It's about people going back home to say, I want to win my constituency. So if we are looking at the number of state governors, you know, the number of members of the National Assembly, the number of 
councillors who want to win elections. I think that is a huge advantage for each of the political parties. The other thing is funding. We can't run away from the fact that funding is needed when you are talking about elections. You need to go print posters, you need to print banners, you need to mobilize you to move from one community to the other, you need to go to market women, you need to a lot of logistics. Jingles, support. jingles radio jingles, advertisements in newspapers, even the social media. You need a lot of funding to, you know. So the political parties that are, you know, that have this kind of structure, they are negotiating from position of strength. Mm -hmm. Of course, the factor of incumbency, if I'm the president of the country, I want my party to win. If I'm the governor of my state, I want my party to win. I will fight tooth and nail to ensure that my, my party wins. So when you look at all these factors, you know, it's a whole lot of advantage. But, but the power, However, of, power of incumbency didn't work in 2015. Yeah. However, mm. we have seen a kind of uh, exceptions, right. you know, in the past years. For instance, you know, in 2015, mm. the power of incumbency did not work. Mm. But then, who are the beneficiaries? The major opposition, APC. Because they also had state governors. Mm. They are, you know, there have been people who have crossed over from the PDP to, you know, APC. So there was a groundswell of a new equation in favor of the APC. So we are still talking about the two dominant political parties. Mm. I'm sorry to say, based on the question today, on the ground today, the APC and PDP are negotiating for a position of strength. It's most likely the pendulum will swing in favor of either of them. However, we should not undermine the power of the people, you know, mm. in terms of the masses, mm. you know, coming up, coming out to say that, look, it is time we want, to, we want a change in terms of who is going to be our leader. But then that has to take a lot of, a lot of hard work, a lot of uh, propaganda, a lot of messaging. The kind of messages I'm saying now, I don't think it can convince a lot of Nigerians. People just attacking candidates. Mm. Mm. Oh, this man is, uh, is uh, his, his face is not good. Oh, he's too old. Oh, he's, uh, you know, he's sick. You know, the, I, there's the regulations for INEC. People have passed through that stage. What people are talking now is that, look, what can this candidate give to Nigerians? Your programs on economy, your programs on environment, your programs on security, your programs on agriculture. I think that is what is more important. Unfortunately, people are dissipating their energy on just singling out one particular candidate, attacking the candidate. And instead of them going to other areas, going to the feed, from one marketplace to the other, from one rural community to the other, they are busy focusing on one particular candidate. And I think they are wasting their time. Because if I'm, I happen to be one of the political parties, I will concentrate more on convincing Nigerians, mm -hmm. not just wasting my time on saying, look, I must bring this person down. Because there are a lot of things to be done on the feed. Rural areas are waiting for you to come and meet them, you know, give them pamphlets, talk to them, move from one place to the other, engage them. Mm -hmm. Constructive engagement of the masses. And then come out with your own program instead of just rubbishing the other party. What did you want to offer to Nigerians? So I think politicians must learn. They must not undermine the integrity of, you know, uh, the voters. The average voter wants to look, okay, this candidate is bad. What did you want to offer? What makes it to be different from that political party? What makes it to be different from that person? So I think people should spend their energy more on convincing Nigerians that they are better instead of spending, concentrating on their energy on saying that, oh, this candidate is bad, so we should not vote for him. Now, if you look at the papers this morning, uh, on the front page of the Daily Trust, talking about uh, potential flashpoints to watch ahead of uh, the elections, and it says the South East, Lagos, Kaduna, Plateau, Kano on yeah. the red list, and it says some of the things that trigger, you know, these things, uh, hate speech, fake news, especially on social media, yeah. we also talk about uh, ethnic and religious profiling, intra-party fighting, legal tussles. I wonder how you think we should handle this ahead of the elections. Yeah, I think the media has a strategic role to play in yeah. terms of, uh, you know, redefining the, the narratives yeah. and setting agenda for conflict prevention and peace building. All right. That is our responsibility. Unfortunately, you know, we have a lot of media organizations that have been set up just to, you know, to, to fuel conflict, to fuel ethnic divide, and they are doing it consciously. I think this is quite unfair to the ethics you know, and integrity of the media. We should try as much as possible to, right. be, to, to balance our views. Unfortunately, some media organizations have just devoted their time to okay. finding a member of disunity, attacking individuals without actually trying to be objective 
you know, to reflect our All right, we need to leave the conversation as, uh, here media. now. Thank you so much, Executive Director, Journalist for Democratic Rights, Adiwali Adiwye, for your time. On Thank, you. Thank you very much.